welcome you all to our meeting, our webinar on researchers and the war in Ukraine. Since the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the start of the war, um, that uh, many researchers throughout Europe have been um, looking for a way to show solidarity with their colleagues in Ukraine. Within the uh, Remo cost action, we were no different, and that we, uh, particularly because of our contacts, to Sergei Levchenko and Anatoly Gonchuruk, who are part of our um, network and um, active members within our network, that we felt a connection to Ukraine. It's also that um, through the origin of the Remo cost action was through work that was done by the Marie Curie Alumni Association and through Eurodoc um, that both of these associations have very, very many, many members from Ukraine who are quite, quite active within the associations, um, including um, Alexandra Ivyashchenko, who will speak later, and also um, Alexander uh, Beresko and uh, Olesia Vashchuk, who will also speak later, that we felt a connection to, um, to Ukraine and to Ukrainian people, as well as so, we have um, set up this webinar to, um, to investigate kind of the effect of the war on Ukrainian researchers. And to start with, we will speak with um, the representatives of uh, Ukrainian researchers, Olesia Vashchuk and Alexander Beresko, who are um, the chair of the Council of Young Scientists and a representative of the Council of Young Scientists of Ukraine. So please, um, can Alessia and Alexander, could you please tell us about the, about kind of the position of researchers in Ukraine and young Ukrainian researchers uh, at the moment and how they have been affected by the war? Um, hi, Brian. Hi, all. Thanks for having us here. And can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay, perfect. So uh, I suggest that uh, I start, if Olesa is okay with this, and I will make a very brief introduction into what is happening right now in Ukraine. So we just give you the context from, let's say, uh, Ukraine, and then Olesa can comment on, because um, I am now in Lviv, which is the western part of Ukraine, and Olesa is in Kiev, which is the capital, directly assaulted by Russian uh, troops and everything else. I'm, I'm uh, associated professor at Lviv Polytechnic National University, also uh, advisory board member of at Europe, Ukrainian NA and general board member of Eurodoc. And Olesa, could you please introduce yourself briefly? I am a council at the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine. Now I am alive and I am a health available this now, thing now. Thank you. So, uh, very uh, brief introduction. So, it is important to understand that the current war uh, hasn't started now. It has started. It started eight years ago with um, annexing annexation of Crimea and bringing this guys army to the Donbas region. So, uh, it's not like something new. Uh, the current phase of the war is a massive attack of Russian troops and shelling of peaceful Ukrainian cities without any sane reason. Uh, Despite Vladimir Putin, no one knows, uh, actually, the reason of it, and perhaps some generals. And uh, what we want to say, and we always repeat this at all possible uh, platforms, is that Ukraine will not surrender and Ukraine will win. But uh, we are grateful for uh, the help of Western world, let's say, and all the world in general, but uh, much more help is needed right now. So this is the current map of hostilities in Ukraine. Uh, which is of today, so we can see that Kyiv is a very hot place at the moment, and many other regions are very dangerous, but especially the city of Mariupol, which is sieged, and actually... Alexander, uh, that we, we can't see the, the slide, we can only see um, your uh, to kind of the first um, slide, we don't see the, 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 um, the shared screen. How about now? Can you see now this? it works. Now it's working. Okay, perfect. So as I said, uh, this is a current map of facilities in Ukraine. So we can see that uh, there are very endangered regions here, especially uh, Kyiv region. Uh, let's say um, southern region, and of course the city of Mariupol, which is constantly bombed every day, and there is a huge crisis there. So uh, the impact of war 
is, let's say, uh, huge, because as of today, uh, almost more than uh, 900 civilians were killed. This according to the data from United Nations, including 115 children. Also, uh, just imagine this number, just try to imagine this. 3 million and 500,000 people became refugees, mostly in the European Union, and 11 people who flee and say, try to find shelter in Western regions of Ukraine, which are relatively safe at the moment, right? So, but uh, fortunately, Ukraine is not alone because, say, Many, many countries, both in Europe, in uh, North America, in South America, Australia, and other, uh, sent not only like declare support, but also sent humanitarian aid. Uh, regarding researchers, right? So that research. Uh, as a fellow of Ukrainians and uh, we are facing the same challenges as other people, right? And it's important to understand that uh, even in especially in um, related to research and academic life and work have stopped. Uh, laboratory work, classes, academic events, of course, everything, uh, many, many, many things are now on pause, on pause, right, are paused. And um, most, I guess, perhaps even all Ukrainian universities, um, let's say, launched holidays, which stopped only today. And today, uh, many universities, especially in Western region, uh, let's say, relaunched so, especially in Lviv Polytechnic, which I belong to, uh, we started educating students like from today. Uh, what I would say, and I guess Olesia and Sofia will comment on this. So even in relatively safe places, <laughs> it's almost impossible to um, stop constantly checking social media news and uh, get rid of this situation. So many, many uh, people, especially in academia, in research institutions, uh, they report the inability to continue meaningful work due to the high level of stress, right? Um, let me also stress that uh, Ukrainian researchers are part of the resistance. Uh, doesn't matter where they are located, right? So of course, many of them volunteered and uh, were drafted in, in the army, but uh, others tried to uh, help Ukraine survive and fight Russia on many different fronts from uh, like um, bringing aid to uh, people in need, to the army, to uh, let's say displaced people, right? Help people to uh, just find shelter. And of course, uh, it's very important to continue the, uh, telling the truth, let's say. And here is, you can see Alessia Vashuk, who is now present, uh, giving um, uh, comments to Al Jazeera. And here is also our colleague uh, commenting to BBC. So uh, Ukrainian researchers who more or less uh, are able to speak English, right? So they uh, do their best to tell the truth all over the world. and. Uh, I might be mistaken, but I guess Young Scientist Council and the Minister of Education and Science of Ukraine released perhaps dozens of uh, letters uh, to um, different organizations explaining what is happening, try asking for help, and Ukraine received much help due to these efforts. Also, Eurodoc um, has a dedicated page uh, regarding Ukraine. And uh, many members of Eurodoc, which is the European Council of Doctor Candidates and Junior Researchers, uh, released statements and uh, tried to support Ukrainian researchers, both in Ukraine and uh, the refugees, in many, many different ways. Uh, so this is probably uh, my quick introduction, right? And here are our emails, Olesias and mine. 
And if you would like to contact us after the event, you are more than welcome to do so. Alessia, perhaps you have some comments. Perhaps you want to add something to my words? You, you very clear and very point to say about situation in our country now. I say only we have, we have very, very bad situation and every day it's a situation most bad and every minute in we don't know what is have next minute next day next week and we have don't we have not life uh, where we have enough day but today we don't know what we have next day it's only about say i want thank you so thanks very much for that Alessia and alexander um and kind of uh, representing the voice of uh, young ukrainian researchers and um, through your organization the council of young scientists history for education focus of the remo cost action is on researcher mental health and um, in order to to deal with uh, the mental health aspect well, we asked alexander to recommend uh, a psychiatrist who's working in ukraine at the moment who can tell us about um, the, the mental health impact of the war on ukrainian people so um, we will speak with uh, sofia novitska from um, the, one of the hospitals in uh, Lviv in Western Ukraine. And um, I now ask uh, Sofia to turn on her mic and her camera. And um, I, I would like to ask her kind of if she could tell us about her daily work at the moment. Hi, <laughs> my name is Sofia. I work as a psychiatrist in Lviv Emergency Hospital. Well, we work 24 hour shifts since the beginning. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm usually have 24 hour shifts, but now I have them every other day since the day one. Um, well, we have different, different, you know, categories of patients we treat right now. So for example, in the first couple of days, we only have stress, acute stress reactions, which were, hap were happening mostly with locals. So for example, with locals in, in my city, in, in Lviv, because we are located in the Western part of Ukraine, we are relatively safe, although we've got a couple of rockets <laughs> in the last two days, but they're, you know, it's not as bad in Kyiv, for example, or I'm, I'm not even talking about the Eastern part of Ukraine, it's just horrific there. So we are relatively safe and we've got some stress, uh, acute stress reaction in the first days. But then we've got the huge wave of refugees who were coming from the eastern part of Ukraine. And around, I don't know, 80% of my, my patients right now, they are the, those are refugees whom I, I'm treating only for like one, two, three days. I kind of st stabilize them in the psychiatry department because, uh, well, a lot, a, a lot of refugees are coming from the railway station and we have kind of like a huge, huge point here. They can stay for the night, for example, in our city, because it's relatively safe. And then they can go from here to Poland or I don't know, any any other part of the European Union, uh, mostly Poland, for, from, from my city, it's mostly Poland. So Lviv is kind of like a, a, a checkpoint where, is it, where is they stay, they have some night sleep, they have food and then they go forward. And unfortunately, we have a lot of uh, acute stress reactions, so dissociative reactions, um, reactive psychosis, a lot of them. And they are just, you know, coming right from the railway station to my department. Then I treat them for two to three days. I, I just stabilize them because they don't really have a lot of time, you know, to get totally healthy. So it's mostly for, for at the moment, it's mostly like stabilizing them, giving them mats for the road and they go forward to their relatives because, you know, some of them, they found some, some friends, relatives, whoever in, I don't know, Germany, Italy, whatever. Uh, and they're going to their home for, for, you know, safe refugee at the moment. So my work mostly is stabilizing and we've Thankfully, we've got a lot of, um, you know, medical help from, from our friends from abroad. So I, I have a lot of 
I don't know. I even have a lot of mats in, in, in right here in my home flat everywhere. I just give it for free for, for refugees just to, to, to stock them for, you know, a couple of weeks when, when they go abroad. And the other category, of course, are soldiers. And my hospital was not actually, you know, built for soldiers. So we have separate hospital for soldiers, but they don't have enough beds. So we treat soldiers as well. And I've never thought that I will be seeing that many people without any, you know, legs or, or hands. And I'm, I'm actually, I do think that we will have to treat mental health of, you know, our doctors in the future as well, because we were not, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm myself, I'm 26. I was not really prepared to see that many damaged and that that were finally damaged people in, in you know, in just like a couple of days. And, um, and it, it happening with every doctor in our hospital, we are, we are, our morale is high and we are working all together 24 hour shifts, day and night. But I feel that, you know, in, in the future, we will have to, to do the separate work with, with, men, with doctors because they're, you know, they're stressed right now. They're working, right? But they, they will need some more mental help in the future. Mm. I don't know, maybe I can, you know, answer some questions. That's, um, I think that, you, I think you've touched on a lot of the, the points that we wanted to raise, kind of that, kind of that uh, the world is seeing kind of a very positive minded, brave yeah. and resilient Ukrainian people at the moment, um, presented with great difficulties. And kind of, did, will there be kind of longer term kind of impact of these uh, of this trauma on the on the mental health of kind of Ukrainian people? Yes, exactly. Because uh, so, for example, uh, PTSD is not diagnosed within the first months. So I'm not able to diagnose someone with PTSD at the moment because we don't have enough time. So for the first months after the you know stressful event. So war, uh, you, we, I'm only, you know, qualified to diagnose people with acute stress reactions. And so it's, and it's, you know, it's, it's different. I can already see that people are forming PTSD and they will definitely have it in the future. And I feel kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm following all the protocols and all the international guides and everything, but I still feel like I, I'm, it's not enough. And I can I can already see that a lot of people will will have PTSD in the future. And uh, I don't know. I just need to read more books how to, how to treat it properly because because I can I can see the life you know forming in the people's minds, but I'm not sure if, if I and other psychiatrists will be able to you know stabilize it. At the moment, I already see a lot of soldiers with flashbacks and all the, you know, sleeping disorders and everything. Um, so, yeah, uh, but for example, we are only treating acute stress reactions and, you know, stress psychosis and, and all the other acute stress uh, disorders. Um, but we will treat PTSDs later. So I think I think this is 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 kind of that at the moment you are dealing with kind of the the most acute problems and the most direct problems that need to be solved. Yeah. But I think that that later as we go forward, that um, that that uh, other problems will emerge. Um, that some of our network are trained counselors and therapists, not all, but some. And kind of, we are encouraging them to uh, volunteer and treat Ukrainians, um, kind of, uh, in, in foreign countries, as as, need, as needs be. Do you have any advice for volunteers treating civilians from Ukraine? Mm. Well, I guess they will. I'm I'm working with mostly, you know, psychiatry patients, and now I see a lot of refugees who are going to the West. And I know I'm trying to stock them with enough meds for for the road and for the first couple of weeks, so they will still have all, all the meds they need uh, in the you know near future. But mm -hmm. they usually need to find some psychiatrists at the place in the country that we're you know going to find some refugee. Yeah, sorry, I can see. Uh, is this the sign of the raise hand there, Svetlana? Um, I will I will kind of have a look and see. Um, 
did I yeah, can't yeah, I raised uh, my Svetlana. Hand. Please, please, Svetlana. Thank you. Uh, Sofia, could you uh, please remind if uh, uh, you have any people that come to you uh, that already suffered in the past with uh, some uh, psychiatric yes. diseases and uh, yes. they don't have enough uh, uh, medicine, enough uh, um, treatment. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's a huge, a huge part of the problem too, because you know we have a lot of new patients that were not, you know, they they were not suffering before the war. But also we have a lot of, you know, our chronic patients who were our our patients before the war, and nowadays we don't really have enough meds and enough treatment in the uh, pharmacies around my city or any other city. So, for example, people who who are kind of I don't really know the word. They're not addicted to drugs, of course, but they, they need drugs, to, you know, for, for in the every day, and they are not able to find those those meds now at pharmacies. So thankfully, again, I'm I'm so thankful that we have a lot of help from abroad. So I'm just you know giving it to everyone without any receipts, to be honest. And no one is really looking for you know. <laughs> not now I, I'm not doing it, you know. So, you know, point to point, I'm just giving, I'm taking, you know, a treatment from my back and I'm just giving it to people without any, you know, documentation or anything. But yeah, so, so we have new patients that we have to treat and we also have my, my old patient who, for example, the, you know, I, I, I work with schizophrenia mostly. I used to work with schizophrenia mostly be, before the war. And, uh, you know, schizophrenic patients, they are chronic and they need their meds on a daily basis. And a lot of them are not able to find uh, those treatment nowadays. And they're getting worse and worse every day. And they, you know, have all the reactions just because they are not able to, due to the stress, and also because the, they are not able to find those meds that they need at the moment. And do you identify some, uh, not from your own patients, but someone yeah. that is coming from the... Yeah. 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 And yeah. also yeah. don't have uh, medicines. But in this case, why uh, don't you address, let's say, um, say Kistri's um, association for help to your um, hospital to send specific medicines in your hospital? I do. I actually do have a list of, of treatment, of, of medical treatment that we need right now. And I, I, I actually, you know, created this list in the first day of work because we kind of predicted that we're going to need them. So I, I have it ready. I can, you know, if, if someone is ready to help, I can share it and I will give my email address for, you know, everyone who's, who's able Bren, to. Bren, I think we can address as a whole uh, community of Remo, mm -hmm. the Psychiatrist Association, so that uh, they can mm -hmm. uh, use their contacts in the countries um, that are able to provide uh, more bigger quantities of these uh, mm -hmm. medicines to to Ukraine. I, I think that's suppose, definitely something yeah. that we can do to ask the people from within our networks who kind of yeah. have contacts within psych uh, psychiatry organizations or psychology True. organizations to. Um, and uh, as Sophia says, it it will just become more and more, and uh, they will need this help from mm -hmm. our side. Oh. And as a Remo action, we can uh, actually provide this kind of support. Um, and just to introduce um, Svetlana, Svetlana is the um, coordinator of Euraxis Bulgaria and is responsible for coordinating um, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of EU policy within the Bulgarian universities. May, may I add some few things here? just to make more clear for, for the people. Your access is actually a network of uh, more than 600 uh, organizations um, in 43 countries, like universities, research centers, etc. And this is a formal initiative of European Commission. So within it, we uh, serve refugee researchers uh, also 
together with all other uh, type of uh, incoming researchers uh, here in Europe and also take care of their career development and also for local mm -hmm. researchers. So um, the point here is to add uh, to uh, the Brian uh, presenting myself is that uh, within your access we had two projects for uh, refugee researchers and I participated in both. It was the previous huge wave from uh, Arabic countries. You know, the previous wars. And uh, after the projects ended, the team of uh, these national coordinators that participated in these projects couldn't stop working on that. I mean, we continue doing our job like uh, informal hub for serving uh, displaced researchers. And they, uh, since the previous one, uh, contacts were mostly with me. I was responsible for training, etc. activities. So the, the list of contacts is with me and they uh, are accustomed to communicate with me. So they continue addressing me for different kind of uh, support and uh, services, etc., and activities that we engage them. And somehow the, the central point for contact is with me for, for all these 43 countries that are currently including Tunisia, Armenia, and Georgia. So these are the newcomers in the network. So my uh, point here is to, to uh, inform you all that if you have specific cases, we are just uh, became also a uh, SAR section for Bulgaria, scholars at risk section. We were accepted just today. So, on top of everything, I'm also engaged with SAR now and uh, do not hesitate to ask me for any kind of uh, questions, support or whatever you would need. I put my contacts in the chat. So, together with Brian, together with our other colleagues for, from all 43 countries, we do work with our national ministries for science and education. And uh, we are coordinating on national level all that we can how. I can, I can confirm that uh, Svetlana is one of the best people people for getting something done in this the, the field. <laughs> and she's one of the most genuine people I've met. So um, that's, um, I think, is, is, a, is, a good, is a good place to, um, to move on and to, um, to see if we can get some sort of uh, support for um, Ukrainian hospitals set up um, from within my, From the top community. of my head, I actually have a question. So. As, as I said, a lot, of, a lot of my, you know, new refugee patients, they're going forward to the European Union mostly. And I, it would be so nice if I could give them some contact lines where they can find psychiatry help at those countries. So for example, maybe, I, I don't even know, maybe there are some, you know, lines you can call if you're in Poland, li lines you can call if you're in, in Italy or in Germany, because so, we have a lot of patients. So I stuck with them with meds for a couple of weeks, for example, I'm trying, at least I'm trying to, for, for, if, if I can, but then they need to find psychiatrists at the place, at the country they were you know, I, I, I think that I can only speak for Germany. That's kind of the way to do this would be to register with the uh, the health insurer and then to uh, through the hospital or through uh, through a practitioner to 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 go that way. I know that for as regards kind of online therapy, there are people who uh, volunteer to provide this. But I think you're talking about more than online therapy for people uh, yeah, who need okay. to be. What I can suggest, Brian, is that uh, we work together, especially that I'm in uh, just the day after I go to your access conference and we'll be able to talk to the European Commission 
personally. Uh, what we can do with you, Brian, with Remo and your access at the same time, we can arrange publishing on our national uh, portals, like the one that I have here for Bulgaria, for instance. I, I will send you right now the link. Um, is that we publish a list of uh, uh, all um, available at the moment uh, contacts and hospitals that can deal with that together with, uh, with the rest of the information available for refugee researchers. Uh, we can publish also this kind of uh, um, this is it. You see I can publish I uh, manage this uh, portal and for Bulgaria and I can publish on there what is available for um, everyone actually, not only for researchers, but any psychological help available as a separate section. And this is something that we prepare currently for each of our countries. Only four countries for now do have such a dedicated page. These are Poland, Czech Republic, Bulgaria and um, uh, sorry and uh, Slovakia. So the rest are under preparation, but we were uh, these four countries were really uh, affected from the first wave very uh, intensively and. Uh, we just prepared something that is that is in needed at the moment. So I will add this information here, give this example to other colleagues and they will also publish. Thanks very much. Alexander has his hand up and wants to ask a question. Yes, if I may. So uh, Please. That's, uh, thanks to all of you who proposed uh, different sort of help in the chat and I copied uh, all your messages so I have your contacts but what I suggest uh, because Brian is a, let's say organizer of this event and moderator so uh, perhaps um, we can try to let's say have a list create a list of needs let's say right not only uh, what is needed in ukraine but also as sophia suggested what is needed abroad uh, just to make it more systematic right mm -hmm. and then uh, brian could perhaps organize a mailing list of the participants something like this mm -hmm. and then we can just be more systemic thanks mm -hmm. i think so um i think that uh, we have some hands up we may come back to later but i think i would like to go forward to um, kind of the, the final speaker, who is uh, Alexandra Ivashchenko from Science for Ukraine, and I think this is probably a good place to go for kind of systematic a systematic response to to helping um, Ukrainian researchers and for a response of the uh, of the research community. So please, Sasha, the floor is yours. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would like to show. Uh, so I'm not. Um mental health specialist, I'm a medical physicist, and I'm involved in various nonprofit organizations. So I would like to show you some initiatives how scientists can help and what, and that's Science for Ukraine, that's the platform that we created, an initiative that's run by volunteers, and um, what we've learned in the last three and a half weeks that we exist. Um, so let me start sharing. Uh, share. Uh, if everything is okay, you, you, I hope that, oh, ah, that one doesn't, okay. Um, we see. Yeah, you see my presentation, but not in the presentation mode. Um, is it okay? Can you, can you see the presentation? It's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm from, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Ukraine, yeah, I'm Ukrainian physicist that, that lives in Ukraine, um, uh, that, that lives in the Netherlands for, for a while. And when um, the war had happened, uh, well, everyone was shocked, but especially those people that are outside of Ukraine, we just didn't know what to do. So together with several volunteers from other countries, we just started a hashtag 
political science for Ukraine, and we just wanted to bring awareness to the topic and just asking people to do something and, and react. And luckily, there was a, a financial support from, from one of the cost actions and uh, that helped us to get time and the time that we could dedicate to the action. So there were four people at the beginning, uh, a, a physicist, engineer, computer scientist, and a social science um, researcher. And the only thing that we knew that we want to help people that cross the border, because if we would have been on, in that place, uh, when you cross the border, you, you are facing several things. You don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. You, you left your country. You have you, 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 you left your career and you need to continue. So we cannot create jobs, but we decided we can start asking people to help and we can collect this information and try to make an accessible way and source of information for researchers. So our mission was just to collect and disseminate positions that are created just for Ukrainian refugees, no special, no, no generic calls, uh, to help scientists and students to find those calls and, um, yeah, it just try to make sure that the uh, the that the misery that our people are put through is at least a bit uh, relieved from their shoulders. Um, so we started. So there was just a hashtag, a Twitter, and different social media platforms, and we started getting information from uh, groups quite fast. Um, just various professors of and in temp temporary positions saying that they would like to host uh, students. And we started distributing this information. So we have, we are contacting, we contacted um, nearly all universities in Ukraine, major universities in Europe, funded agencies, and we created just a booklet trying, like we, we, we are there to help. We have various organizations, like a legal organization, also like the volunteers that can provide mental support. And we just try and to work together and um, help people find a way around. And we, there are several goals that we have. So the short term, just make sure that people can get roof on top of their heads and not sit in the refugee camps. Then, of course, there are midterm goals, make sure that within that time they can have space and peace to find a more um, permanent solution. And, uh, and then long term, uh, how we make sure that many, many people that left home, that none of them is leaving their home willingly. Uh, so how can we make sure that they can they have a place to go back and we can sustain Ukrainian education? And again, we started with four people and uh, yesterday there were 92 people already and that's only pure science for Ukraine. Uh, and we also have partner organizations. So in total, there are about 200 uh, volunteers that are working. So if I just um, look at the map, that's if you go to our website, uh, yeah, we have various social media, but every time that we find a new position, we share it on uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. There's also Telegram. There's a, well, the, yeah, there's a sensor in my room. That's why I'm waving like this. It's just going down. Um, yeah, so we have um, we have a website. Uh, uh, you can, uh, if you know anyone in need, uh, they can go there. They can search for positions uh, for researchers, academic transfer for students. Uh, accommodations and every time we get them we share them and to the day uh, like today there were more than like more than 1200 groups posted positions and the great thing usually those are several positions so it looks like if there's a lot and you, you probably see a lot of news but actually it's not that much because if we clearly look at the numbers, so within Science for Ukraine, I'm responsible for outreach to Ukraine and almost all requests of students go through me student scientist, I'm, I'm their main contact person. So the first week we didn't see any requests. And then in the second week, we got more than 2000 requests from students. And that was quite shocking. And if you, for, so for students, there are like more than, more than 1.3 million of students that were in Ukraine. There were hundreds of thousands of refugees. But even if we look purely at these 1200 positions and what the number of scientists that were in Ukraine, there were 95,000 
scientists in 2021, according to the Ministry of um, Ministry of uh, Education. So, the 45 percent of them are women. At least 26 to 52 thousand will live. So 25, it's of 26 thousand is if half of all women will live. So, uh, and and if if we just hypothesize that all the uh, women will live, then it's 52 thousand. There is no way that we will be able to accommodate them because there are not enough universities in, in Europe. Every university, single university will need to open 10 to 20 positions. It's just not possible. And people just don't want to leave. Their the men cannot leave. So many contacts that we started, many requests that we started getting in the, in the second week approximately were that it's very nice. We help scientists that move, but what about those that stay? If we are looking clearly, there are 75 to 80 percent of scientists will stay, and there were a lot of discouraged people because, um, yeah, it's a terrible situation. You're seated at home. The, you're you cannot you cannot work anymore. As the, the colleagues from Ukraine already stated, the science stopped. You. Some scientists can leave and we can help them, but we, and that's very important, but we also shouldn't forget those that are staying, that cannot work and that have um, this stress on top of them. Uh, so they have, it's even more difficult for them. And if we look carefully at the, so that's when we also started looking at new possibilities uh, of like offering remote work because many male sign uh, uh, many men from Ukraine uh, approached us and said I'm, I'm a computer scientist and an engineer and when I looked really the most advanced scientific fields in Ukraine if you look at all these fields they're just standard R&D fields it's very easy we, we just went through two years of COVID and it's relatively easy to arrange remote jobs for them well, in the countries where it, it's possible, uh, because those people are affected physically, they're affected mentally and financially. And it's important to focus on 25 to 52,000 that will leave, but we shouldn't forget that that's, that that's the minority. And we shouldn't forget that we should, we, we need to make sure that the scientists, Ukrainian scientists, no matter which side of the border they are, that they stay connected, that they stay as a group and we think of the ways to create in the league. And that's also something that the ministry is actively working on. And, and that's one of the task forces they're trying to make the digital link between that. But we should facilitate it because a lot of organization, it, researchers uh, have a lot of power and influence on governmental organization and we should try to use the power together um, to, um, to accelerate the decisions that needs to be made. So, um, uh, yeah, we are volunteers. Um, this is the, the platform that is growing. Um, I, I, it, it's not a promotional presentation, but please, if you can spread the word about the organization, um, any initiative. So we have various web pages with help and support. We are adding the page with legal supports that scientists can use uh, for free in, a, in every country. Uh, we are working on an extra page with a free mental support. Uh, so raise, like spread the word about the organization. Uh, we have help for people that are in, in the EU and in Ukraine. And if you have any suggestions, please, um, contact us in any type of social network that you have, uh, or just uh, email me uh, directly. Uh, my contacts, yeah, I didn't add my email address here, but uh, I, I will share it in the chat and we are open to any collaboration and any suggestion. Um, yeah, um, I would like to answer any questions that you have. So thanks very much, Alexandra. Um, I will now go to, um, I think the first question is from Christiana uh, Schweren. Um, and uh, please turn on your mic and your camera, Christiana. 
I know it, it was not really a question, it was a comment on, on Sophia's mm -hmm. and your idea to, to come up with lists of contact people. And I think, um, so So the only thing I know about is uh, that in Mannheim, the Central Institute for Mental Health has a specific uh, ambulance for Ukrainian refugees with about 20 Ukrainian psychiatrists opened. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not just... Um, a country level thing that this is the contact person in the country, but I don't know whether Remo has any possibility to collect this type of data, because I think if you go to a German insurance health insurer, mm -hmm. it will take five months until you get any reply. So you should and, know about and, these and little what, places. What, what you're saying about, um, about, kind of, uh, about kind of the system finding um, skilled people from, from within the refugee community, Oh, no, about Ukraine? about about just collecting for about, for uh, for the yeah. refugees information. So if you mm -hmm. tell them get in touch with a like yeah, on country level list, it doesn't make sense not, because it's too slow. I can understand. Yeah, but uh, I, so, I think yeah. that for us to do this on a local level within Germany or within, I think we're spread too thinly to do this. Um, Kind of to to because we may have kind of uh, even in Germany we have quite a lot of people involved but it's kind of maybe twenty people uh, tops and that's uh, and kind of uh, I think to get the, them to do this on a countrywide basis is is probably uh, um, is probably ambitious but I think that the way that what you're saying is what I've heard on the German talk shows is that this is it was a it was a question that was raised. And that um, that they they said that they were looking for skilled people from within the um, kind of the, the people who have fled Ukraine to de to help deal with this problem. So, uh, kind of psychiatrists, psychologists, teachers, uh, for, and kind of I think this is exactly what you're saying is happening in Mannheim. So I think that the that I think in some ways there are some things that you can do as a volunteer, and there are some things that are but better organized uh, for, by the, the people on the ground within the hospitals. And no, sure, but what I'm, I'm saying is that it would be wonderful to have lists of these initiatives, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. so that someone like Sophia can give mm -hmm. her patients, look, if you end up in Germany, Mannheim has that. If you end up in the Netherlands, yeah. it's Amsterdam yeah. or something. So, Christiana, that, to come back, yeah. yeah, so come back to that point. That's one of the main things why we even created the website, because the problem is not that there is no help. The problem is that when you cross the border, you have a phone. You, you, or even before, it's even more, when you sit in the bomb, shel uh, bomb, uh, a bomb shelter, you have a phone with you and you have no idea. And there are thousands of thousands of messages. So it's very important to start centralizing and providing accessible information for, for refugees, especially when you're dealing with so much stress and men mental stress, mm -hmm. you, you have no space and attention to search for those so exactly uh we would be happy so sophia and anyone else if you would like to centralize so that's exactly what we are trying to do if you have any ideas we would be very happy to add them we, we at the moment if we combine all social media we have more than fifty thousands of ukrainian followers uh, so we would be happy to promote that information and just find the ways to providing valuable links to various areas like if you're in Germany and those are different options that's where you can go and we do everything again we are volunteers we do everything for free we have full control we don't need to ask the permission which we are just trying to help yeah so exactly if I could you know have a list of contacts I could print it out and give it to you know refugees they're going abroad so here is the uh, you know, list of the paper, it's not on your phone. So, for example, a lot of refugees are, you know, older age and they're not really good with using, you know, Instagram, mm -hmm. for example. They're not able to find some help on Facebook or something. And it's really useful to just give them something printed out with a phone number. So, that's the address. You can call that place when you're, you know, on a place. Sophia, so what, for example, what we can do, if we gather information, we can make a searchable database available only for you or some doctor, because it's a private information. I can understand that not everyone will be yeah. willing that, but we, we would be very happy to co collect uh, information from various countries so that the doctors can give an advice and can get those contact information for people that are on the move. 
dependent on the direction where they're going. It's impossible to predict the city where you will end up, but just to give you a hand. That's uh, Alexandra Antonyuk has her hand up and I yeah. ask her Thank to you ask her question. Thank you very much. Maybe this is not the question, but the comments. I'm a mathematician. Usually I'm working in Kyiv Institute of Mathematics, National Academy of Science, but now I have I located to Kyiv and I'm also president of the Ukrainian Humboldt Club. So I have contacts not only inside of my field of mathematics, but also with uh, scientists from all other disciplines, biology, physics, chemistry, and so on. And I would like to thank uh, to the organizers of this meeting. It is really very important and updated. And I would like uh, to turn your attention to the uh, idea, to the point that Alexandra Ivashenko mentioned. 90% of Ukrainian scientists remain in Ukraine. For example, me personally, as women, I may shift to Germany and find a position with no problems. But my principal position to stay here with my country, with other with men, scientists, men who may not leave the country. That's why the point that Alexandra has mentioned that it is extremely important for Ukrainian science, for the future of Ukrainian science, to find the remote poss possibility for the remote position. And even more, maybe this is a question to Svetlana Dimitrova. For example, in my institute, there is a, a Horizon 2020 project in the framework of RISE, a European project which holds <laughs> exchange months. Of course, we cannot fulfill these exchange months in the situation where we are. We have partners from Germany, Czechoslov Czech Czechia, uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. And if it's possible, for example, these funds to, uh, for these funds, permit Ukrainian scientists from our Institute of Mathematics to use for the remote, for the remote contacts. It's also one of the possibility of the support by existing fund from the European, uh, European Commission. So my uh, point to all the uh, presented here people, let us try to find another possibilities for the remote position for digital position for Ukrainian mm -hmm. science since uh, we obviously feel the very brain drain of special for young scientists, for experienced scientists. And let us think about the future, how we will recover the Ukrainian science after the war. And I will ask for your help, please. That then within the framework of the cost program, there is virtual mobility grants. And I know that kind of one of our kind of uh, the chair of our working group well on policy impact, uh, Janet Metcalf, was on the advisory group for the Mary Skudowska Curie actions. And she, a, a number of years ago, and I know that she recommended that they introduce virtual mobility. And it hasn't happened yet. Let it would, be, it would have been good for your rise if they had, if they had done this. Um, so um, I would like to ask uh, Alex uh, Vanschelboim um, to uh, to speak now. He's got his hand up. And so Alex, the floor is yours. Oh yes, yes. I'm uh, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida, and uh, um, uh, we have slightly different approach. Uh, we, here in Jacksonville, we have. Uh, kind of Russian Ukrainian speaking community and we're happy to have but we also have a large robust uh, Jewish Federation and uh, we have experience uh, and uh, I'd be happy to contact them and, and work with you guys and you know by and large everyone from our community and from Jewish Federation we include many faiths it's not just jewish christian any it's just a federation but nearly every one of us we have ukrainian roots and we consider you as our brothers and sisters and we're happy to help uh what i uh, would like to suggest uh, we uh, operate quite differently we typically would start from grassroots, collecting donations, collecting uh, information. We have beautiful University of North Florida here with great campus. And um, 
I would like to establish contact with someone. The main problem is that uh, it has to be, it got to be some kind of legal nonprofit entity where people can donate money. Is anyone can advise on this? And I also have second mm -hmm. statement to make. Oops, this, uh, uh, I, I would more than happy to be contact person, to go to our community, to raise money, to raise uh, science, if you will. Uh, we have Naval Medical Center who deals with PTSDs. We have Mayo Clinic here, but uh, uh, it got to be some kind of organization. We don't know who you are, people. We need we need something like um to know more uh, who you are, what you do, how many whom whom we represent. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Please contact me. Be happy to help. Second, uh, just to share with you my experience. Last night it was almost uh, midnight, Brian, when I replied to you. Uh, I, in 1991, I was under missile bombardment for two months in Tel Aviv. And I really uh, can share my compassion with you guys. PTSD, unfortunately, does not go away. You always would have to live with it. And, uh, best way to treat PTSD in my experience. If you, if you, if you scientist and if you have PTSD, it is difficult. It is difficult to perform science. Uh, best way, early intervention and get to work as soon as possible. Get to work, do, do something. So those two things I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, to say to you. First and foremost, I'd like to get in touch with some contact person, uh, with some organization whom we can establish uh, contact and work with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. As regard kind of a, an entity in the United States, I know that we're in touch with Scholars at Risk Europe, and they have uh, the main Scholars at Risk is based in New York. Um, so. Um, I know that, that scholars at Risk Europe are uh, are beginning to uh, set up a lot of the, uh, to work with people like um, Svetlana in Bulgaria and throughout Europe, so to, to help kind of scientists fleeing. And I think that to, I think to to build into their kind of program something to to deal with the, the mental health impact on researchers. I think would be a very very good idea. I think it's something that maybe we could come back to over the next, maybe not straight away, but towards the end of this year. I think I think that definitely we could come back to this topic. Um, and I, just that, need, I, I just need mm -hmm. name of a non-profit entity mm -hmm. where we can start our grassroots campaign, collect donations, perhaps mm -hmm. uh, establish some scholarship here in, in North mm -hmm. Florida. You know, I, I can't operate mm -hmm. and I can't speak on global, but we can help here locally. If you, think... don't, if you don't have nonprofit in the United States, it will be very difficult to collect money because mm -hmm. uh, according to US, US law, we have to have some kind of nonprofit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, or at risk yeah. is the right uh, yeah. organization but for that. I think uh, I think Sasha uh, Alexandra yeah. wanted to say say something. Yeah, so I, that's exactly the same thing as Svetlana was already saying. Scholars at Risk is an international nonprofit organization that is also very active in Ukraine, and they are providing many uh, uh, fellowships for Ukrainian. There's Ukrainian Ukrainian specific fellowship, and your university can become a member. And by donating money to them, you can fund positions, temporary positions for scholars and any support. So that that is the best body to go to. Uh, the only thing that on the short term, the, the, the response is, of course, a bit, a bit slower than with individuals. But that's a sustainable long term option. Uh, please, uh, please send me contacts. We have attorneys here. They will check. If you need mm -hmm. help to establish nonprofit here in the United States, yes, yeah, so it already it. it already exists. It's called okay, okay. 
I will, I will, I will, I will share with you the details, and I will put you in touch with Scholars at Risk and also the European Director who who used to work in New York beforehand. And thank you. Um, I think that uh, Stefan Mailish has his hands up, and then he's from the Alexander von Humboldt uh, Foundation. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Brian, for introducing me. I'm very happy to participate in this uh, webinar and on the suggestion of Alexander Antoniuk. And I really want to reconfirm the pledge she made. Um, virtual cooperation, I mean, actually was uh, born and driven by the pandemic, which was very unfortunate. But right now, I must say, we have learned a lot and it, we can use this to make our programs of support a lot more flexible. Also with regard to supporting Ukrainian uh, scientists and scholars. And the Humboldt Foundation already introduced a pilot project to support people in developing countries. And, and this is a lesson we learned and can now uh, uh, make profitable with regard to new uh, options for sponsorship. Yeah, I mean, the idea which I have is to make it as flexible as possible, which means you should be able also to travel, yeah? Because you need to, to, to make some contact to your colleagues who are cooperating with you abroad. So it's good to have some time to go abroad and then some time to stay at home. So, and you would be uh, invited to, to plan yourself the duration of uh, the time you spend at home, or abroad. So this is something I really support to, to, yeah, to not let the brain drain, which mm -hmm. we, which we do expect, of course. Yeah. The younger the people are, the easier they leave forever. And this is important. When we invite somebody to come to Germany to already attach to this invitation, a longer period of time of return fellowship support, yeah. So the idea is to send an invitation with the invitation to return, also with material funding, of course. So I'm I'm just happy to to get this kind of feedback that this is important and uh, yeah, we are now rushing for funding. Uh, things are not that easy as I I, I thought, but. Uh, I guess uh, everybody is going to support scientists and scholars in Ukraine. Yeah, thank you very much. So, um, Alexandra Ivashenko has her yeah. hand up and would like to respond. Yeah, I would like to uh, react on what uh, Stefan uh, just mentioned. So, as you clearly, like, nicely indicated, people, the younger the people, the easier it is to leave. So, we are talking about those 1.3 million students from Yadbury, all of female students, they can live and there are a lot of foreign students. Um, so we should really make sure that, um, yeah, so especially in Ukrainian, um, the ministry is very flexible in the way supporting students. They are allowed to transfer uh, credits to the next year, to non-creating years, and they are very open allowing additional and the, the uh, online education to help graduating year, so the bachelor, the fourth year to finish education. So it's very important that we help to provide online education to these students so that they can, in Ukraine, finish their years without the need to go across the border and find the option to, for academic transfer and support themselves. Because it's, we, uh, I, I, I stayed myself at the, at the Polish border for a few, few days and uh, the number of students that you see crossing that are very young have no idea. It's a lot of stress. It's a mental stress. They, they, they most likely will not come back if they will start the academic trust, but they will be traumatized. So the fastest way of supporting Ukraine and preventing the brain drain is making sure that these people have a chance to, to finish their education and continue in Ukraine. So thanks very, very much, um, uh, Sasha. Um, Alex has his hand up again, or do you have a question? Or is it, um, is, 
is it just, uh, do you just have a, your hand up? I think there were a number of questions in the chat. I don't know if I will be able to get to all of them, um, but uh, we will go through the, through the, ch the chat uh, at a later stage. I see that there's a question from Sebastian Dalla from the University of Ljubljana in uh, Slovenia. And he was asking about um, many of the organizations which who, that are helping um, similarly to Science for Ukraine. But is ask, I think the gist is he's asking if there is um, kind of coordination between all of these people uh, volunteering. I think this is something that we, we talked about before. There is some, but I think volunteers have uh, have. I mean, that I'm, I can see that Sasha is doing a huge amount of work and. Um, yeah, I think that we that's it would be good to to bind all of these initiatives together. But I think everybody is trying to do something, and if the sum of all of the efforts adds up, that we will get a lot of work done. Um, I think with that, I would like to thank all of our speakers tonight: um, Sofia Novitska, um, Alexander Baresko, uh, Olesya Vashchuk, and um, also. Uh, Alexandra Ivashchenko from Science for Ukraine, and all of the audience who turned out to, to talk with us and to ask questions and to be active and engaged. So thank you very, very much for your engagement. And I would like to, to thank our um, kind of the two members of our network who turned up today, um, so Anatoly Goncharuk and also Sergei uh, Levchenko from uh, Odessa. So. Um, with that, I wish you um, all of the best of luck and hopefully we can meet together in better times um, and um, kind of that we can all contribute to helping the work of Sasha with Science for Ukraine and kind of to, to, to help, um, help show solidarity in a practical way with our colleagues from Ukraine. Thanks very much.